Welcome to the Device Tree Boff ELC 2018 version. I'm Frank Caroland. I'm one of the Device Tree maintainers in the Linux kernel. And I'm here to hear from you guys. Not so much to give slides. So I do have a lot of slides. Uh, my normal methodology is to have about 150 slides for a 50 minute slot. And I think I have 30 or 40 slides before I get to the end slide, and then like another 20 or 30 backup slides. So if you guys have no questions, I can talk. But really, this is all about you guys. Uh, the agenda for today is, first of all, I'm going to collect a list of questions or areas of concern and not address them right away, hopefully. <laughs> uh, there are a few things that I do want to talk about. But knowing how many questions are coming will tell me whether I should be just going really fast through what I have and glossing over it, or whether I should spend more time and talk in more detail. And then actually come back and answer your questions and have you guys say things. Um, if you don't have something added to the list to begin with, don't worry about it. We can always add it in through. So like I was saying, it's just trying to get a sense of how much you guys have, how much time you all want to take up versus what I take up. Um, I will be talking about what's happened recently, what I see coming in terms of conferences, that's events. That's nice and short. Um, a little bit about what's been going on, not just in the kernel, but also in the tools area, like the device tree compiler area. Um, and then, like I said, back to the, the questions. So right away, let's get started. If people have areas of concern or questions they want to ask, just to get a list of those, just real quickly. Anybody want to jump up? Yes. Uh, just a simple question to start off. You know, I've kind of dug into this trying to find, hey, for my device, you know, for my system, I need to implement this device. What is a good, like, where's a good place to look for, hey, this is the documentation. If you're going to implement a new device, this is how you should do it. Because okay. I've just been working off examples, and sometimes yeah. examples yeah. don't match. Got it. I don't know the real theory behind it. Got it. OK, and actually, you, you did fine there, not to dish you or anything. But at this point, you don't actually need to ask the whole question. Just more give me a real quick subject area, just so it gets on the list. And then we'll ask the whole detailed question later. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I recently started working on ARM. I was in x86 earlier. Mm -hmm. So one of the things which I found while compiling my device tree code was it gave me errors and warnings, but they were not really helpful to find what exactly I had done wrong. OK, so, so that's the device tree compiler, yeah, it's a compiler for the machine. device tree source. OK, yeah. so error message from DTC. Yeah, it's not really helpful, in my opinion, to help out find what actually you're yeah. doing wrong. And yeah. it took me a little while to figure out that. OK, that's a good one. Got that. Next, back here. Up uh, here. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about or hear about uh, overlays and overlays uh, management, uh, okay. how people handle fragments and stuff like that. OK, so overlays and overlay management. Yeah, I, I do have some slides on overlays, and there is some new stuff. Um, that's often a very hot topic, so we'll, we'll definitely talk about overlays. There's something further back? Uh, different device tree source formats. OK. You're thinking potentially YAM, pardon, YAML? Yeah. OK. OK, got that. We, it, you don't get uh, to talk back there, but where's? Oh. Okay, overlay, overlay removal and removal in an order that is not, you know, the uh, stack order. Okay. Okay, next. Yeah, so negative values for, or integers for like hardware ranges. Uh, what's the general, let's say, feel or acceptance or? Okay, guide? negative values for prop, negative numbers for property values. Okay. Licensing of include DT bindings. Now we <laughs> suddenly got SPDX identifiers all over the place, and before there was no explicit license. Okay, okay, yeah. So licensing of device resource files. Okay. I would like to hear something about upstreaming support for custom boards. Okay, let me get that down. Uh, 
device trees hold on, hold, hold on. and yeah. almost there. Good. Okay, next one. Uh, device tree and uh, UIO devices. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So at this point, I know I have enough UIO devices. Um, I know I have enough content comments and questions that I will go really fast through my stuff and come back and try and spend almost all of our time on your comments and questions. So that's exactly what I need. I've got plenty to know. And we'll come back and collect more questions as we get there. Um, so starting just real fast, what's happened the last year for conferences and events. Uh, there was no session at Plumbers last year because there wasn't enough people interested in it at the time. Last year at ELC Europe, there was a, a full day event organized by Grant, likely. And this is the crowd that was there. Some of you were there. Um, just in summary, there were four main topic areas. Uh, validation tools was really one of the driving forces for Grant to put the conference together. Uh, runtime usage was a big topic area. Maintenance issues, and then a whole bunch of miscellaneous things. Uh, the main thing I want to point out here is that on elinux.org, there actually is really good documentation of this workshop. Uh, there were notes taken by individuals, plus notes taken, I, th I think, in a group effort. Grant does have an audio recording of the entire event if anyone wants it from him, but it's a very large file. So I encourage you to go to this website to, if, you're very in if you're interested in what happened last year. And there was a lot of discussion on a lot of areas. And this to give you a sense, there really were a ton of specific sessions listed there. Plumbers this year, we are having a session in Vancouver. If you're a plumbers, please come and join us. If you're, whether you're coming to, to plumbers or not coming to plumbers, if you have topics that you want discussed in the group, uh, please let us know. Send emails to me um, and just let me know that you want to get the topic onto the agenda. The agenda's already published, but it's fluid. We, we really are welcoming changing it to, to deal with whatever the current hot topics are. We're not wedded to our, our current schedule. Uh, this is old news. Just to remind everyone, we no longer are using the ePapper as our reference source backing up our bindings. We're using the device tree specification. The device tree specification was created by taking the appropriate material out of the ePapper and excluding chapters that didn't really apply and a little bit of wordsmithing, but essentially it's the same document. And it's intended to evolve over time and um, provide more bindings information in a central location. But it's been really quiet over the last year. Very little progress has been made on modifying this document. OK, a little bit of history on things that have happened in the last year technically. The device tree project is separate from the Linux kernel. We actually import their um, content into, into the Linux kernel on a periodic basis. Basically, whenever Rob thinks there's been a, a, a sufficient amount of change or there's a feature out there that we really want to pull in. So if there's a feature out in that project that you're waiting for and you really want it and, and you're watching and Rob's not doing a poll, just speak up and say you'd really like to, to get a more current version. And it does happen fairly frequently already. Um, so just a quick overview. And again, I'll try and be real fast because I know you guys have lots of questions. What's been going on the last year? Uh, answering part of your question about alternative source formats for device trees, there is now an option to output in YAML format. Yeah, YAML fo format. And that's intended to be used by other automation tools doing validation. There is no input option for YAML, only output at this point. Um, there is a new Python library that's seen a lot of patches and a lot of features added this year. And, and that library is focused at the binary flattened device tree. It's, I, I th I'm pretty sure. I'm just in the name libfdt. I myself have never used the library, so I've not been paying attention to it, other than noting lots of commits going into it. Um, there have been a lot of questions and concerns about sizes of device trees, both the flattened image on disk or in, in other storage media, and in the bootloaders and in the kernel, the actual memory used by them. Uh, so there are a lot of people trying to reduce how big the, the device trees are, the binaries that we're dealing with. 
one thing that's been implemented is a switch on the compiler to exclude nodes that are not actually referenced. So if you have a device resource with a lot of nodes, but you have no p-handle references into a bunch of those nodes, they can get essentially left out of the compiled device tree. So that feature's in there. Um, overlays, we used to have to specify a lot of the metadata of what an overlay looks like in the device tree source file. The compiler's been modified, what we've been calling the syntactic sugar. So you can, at a very high level, I'll give examples later, um, essentially give the, the compiler enough knowledge that it knows that the nodes you're talking about are overlay nodes, and you don't have to provide all that extra metadata surrounding it. So that, that makes the, the device tree sources a lot cleaner. Um, finally, there's a, a new tool that Pantelis wrote this year. It's called FDT Overlay. And the concept behind it is if you have a, base, a compiled base device tree and you have one or more compiled overlays, if you want to apply those overlays to the base device tree and have your output be yet another flattened device tree, the binary, you can do that. So that's at a build time, essentially. So you're not waiting until you get to the bootloader or to the kernel. You're actually creating a merged um, device tree out of all the pieces. I have not played with this at all or looked at it. I'm not sure how evolved it is. We pull the source into the Linux kernel. We don't build it yet. Um, so I, I think it needs a, a good bit of auditing since it's so new before we actually enable it in the kernel tree, just to make sure how solid it is. And one potential concern I have, and this is a theoretical concern since I haven't looked at it, is there's a lot more flexibility before you boot the system to apply an overlay than there is once the kernel is booted and you're applying, trying to apply an overlay to a live tree. Um, just for an example, when, you, when the kernel boots, uh, various subsystems will take a look at the device tree and they'll create their data structures and get a sense of what the, the system is all about. If you apply an overlay later that impacts the subsystem's view on the world, it's a lot more complex for the subsystem to add that extra knowledge in after the fact than it is for it to do it when it was first booting. Um, if you apply your overlay before the kernel even sees it, that whole problem just disappears. The kernel has no idea that you've applied an overlay and all the subsystems just see the whole big picture from the very beginning. Because of that difference, there are some restrictions on what an overlay that gets applied at runtime can look like. It's not quite as wide open as what you can do before a boot. So there may be some differences between what this tool and what the bootloaders allow in applying an overlay versus what the kernel will allow at a runtime overlay. So that, that's one issue we just need to be aware of um, when developing an overlay. It may not actually apply in all cases. You may actually have to have more restrictive rules um, runtime overlay application. Um, one thing to be aware of when you're building your source device resources, especially if you're a couple of kernel versions back, Rob has been very busily adding additional compile time checks. And this goes a little bit toward the, the one comment about the compiler error message can be really cryptic. Um, so this is one thing that Rob's been doing to to make things a little bit more clear and catch issues a little bit earlier in the, the build um, process instead of at the boot, boot time. Um, just to give you a sense, this is what, what's gone in since February of last year. So just an incredible, these are the, the actual commits. So just a ton of new checks. So if you're on an old kernel version and you jump forward three or four kernel versions, you're going to start seeing a whole lot more warnings when you compile your device resource, potentially. So just be aware that those are coming, and you might want to, when you're planning to jump ahead, try and compile with a newer device tree compiler and, and work out those warnings ahead of time. Save yourself some effort. Overlays. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, one good thing, U-Boot has added a lot of support for 
applying an overlay at boot time. I've, I'm not real familiar with it, so I, I can't speak to it um, authorita authoritatively. I can simply say that's a really good alternative to doing a runtime overlay application, and I highly suggest looking into that if is one of your alternatives if you have overlays. Validation has been going on for three or four years now, and it's been moving in fits and starts and not making a lot of progress until this year. And Rob has been doing a lot of work on this recently. There are patches on the, the kernel mail list. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead to a different subject. Um, this is my patches. <laughs> Um, I've had a lot of concerns about memory leaks from overlays, overlays being applied and removed. And I thought it would be a good idea to add some validation into the kernel that would try and catch memory leak issues. Um, a second major concern I have is referencing, pointers referencing data after the, the memory's been freed. And this doesn't deal with that at all. This is only dealing with memory leaks. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of, of messages that come out now. The messages may change before it gets into the real mainline kernel because the patches are still under development. But this will give you a good sense of what's going on. If you are using FPGAs and using overlays with FPGAs, you will start getting these messages as soon as these patches are accepted into the kernel when you're running against those kernels. Alan Toll's been testing them, and he's seeing the warnings. He found one real um, problem in the clock code where um, there was a mismatch between in the re reference countings, counts, and he already has a patch out to deal with that. So it's already been useful. The thing I didn't expect was the kernel has some broken code <laughs> in the device tree core code. And this pointed out a bunch of, of problems. And I have patches in the same series now dealing with a lot of those issues. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's still some more issues to be found. Um, there is the famous out-of-tree overlay loader, which is still being maintained. Um, uh, Garrett, you're maintaining it, right? For reporting it every release. Um, do you, you publish that somewhere where people see it? Can grab it. Okay, so it's a branch in, in Geert's Renaissance re repository. So even though we're not supporting it in mainline, if you want to try and follow along and not get too far behind in your kernels, just watch what he's doing. And he keeps testing as I keep changing the core APIs. So that, that's one good thing in keeping, making sure that this code will keep working hopefully moving forward, and hopefully we, we make things continue to work cleanly. So here are some examples of, of warnings and errors. And I'm not going to go into any detail at all on these as to why the, the warning error comes out from a, a given device tree. We can come back and talk about this if we have time at the end. Or catch me later. I'll be glad to talk about this in the hallway. Um, but these are just examples. Typically, it's warning that Either there potentially will be a memory leak um, when the overlay gets removed. So these messages are coming out, in this case, when the overlay, overlay is applied. Um, there are messages when the, the removal occurs, which is that, that third message. It's detecting it's gotten to a point in the removal process. It expected the ref count to come down to one. It's going to get decremented one more time, and we're going to free the memory. It turns out the ref count was too high still. And it'll tell you how high it is. And this is one of those cases where not enough OF node puts are happening. The OF node gets and puts are, are out of balance. And this will at least tell you which nodes are at issue and which ones you're going to have a memory leak because of. Um, there's some cases of we can create a flattened device tree overlay that will not apply cleanly. And in the current kernels, you apply it, you get errors warning about name collisions. And the apply code ends up renaming the property or the node. So that's the symptom you see today. 
this is the underlying what's going to catch it. And I've created a test case, so I understand at least one way to create this problem in the source code. So we're starting to get an understanding of, of why that can happen. But now at least I have to check. So I'm catching the fact that you're going to end up with a corrupt uh, data structure in the kernel and refusing to load the overlay in that case. And if you look in my patches or in my slides after the fact, these are um, device tree overlay sources that I've added to the unit tests that show examples of how you can get to those, those problem areas. And finally, there's one error code which you cannot cause with your device tree source in your overlay. It means something's wrong in our internal core code. <laughs> so that's something that we have to deal with. One issue I've talked about in the past is metadata. And if you're familiar with overlays, you'll understand this. If you don't know overlays, don't worry. This is only 30 seconds. Um, you'll know that there are fragments. There's an underscore symbols node, underscore fixups, underscore local fixups. All that metadata you shouldn't have to deal with. That's something the compiler should deal with, something that the overlay loader should deal with. And I was concerned about the amount of space that all of that metadata was taking up in the, com in the compiled device trees. And so I decided it was going to be a good idea to change the format of the flattened device tree, or the .dtb. And I sent out a, a patch series at the beginning of this year. David Gibson came back with some good ideas. I think the end result might be a merge of some of his ideas and some of my ideas. But those threads died really quickly. We didn't get much engagement. And somebody needs to pick this up again. Hopefully, I will pick it up. It is one of the plumber's topics if we can get enough people talking. There is a side effect of going to a new format. We can actually gain some new features. Uh, one feature I don't list here is potentially deleting a node. We can't delete nodes and overlays because there's nothing in the format that allows us to do that in the current binary format. Um, one thing that I really like is that we'll be able to take a, a blob and decompile it and regain all of our symbolic information, all of our p-handle values as p-handle references, not just as integers, all of the labels put back onto the source code. Simple matter of programming. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm assuming that we will modify the DTC compiler to actually include that in, in decompiling, because it's just so obvious that once we have that in the format, it's a, such a useful feature. Uh, if nobody else does it, I'll be twisting arms to make that happen. So I was saying that there's going to be a lot of overhead, and that was my concern. Here's an example of overhead. The green line, the top line, is how, much, uh, how many bytes are used for the overlay metadata for a given device tree. I looked at all the ARM device trees in the kernel. So just think of them. The horizontal axis device tree number one was some device tree, who knows who it was. And for every single, there are close to 1,000 device trees that I compiled and measured this data for. So each of these points on the graph is for one device tree. Once I've compiled it with symbolic information, what is the overhead? And with the current format, that's the top green line. With the proposed format that I gave in my patches, I saved a lot of space, and that was the lower line. You can see there's a significant amount of space saved by going to a new format. And that's just the tabular version. These are the things that are that metadata I was talking about. If you've been dealing with overlays, you've been having to hand code this stuff. It's time to quit hand coding this stuff. We, we have the support in the compiler. You don't need to worry about all that extra complexity, all that confusion. The first time I saw this stuff, I just was like, what the heck is going on? It took, my, it took me a long time to wrap my head around it. The metadata part, or what's in color up here, so the fragment node, the nodes that begin with an underscore, all of those go away. So if we take this overlay source and replace all that meta stuff with the new syntax, all that stuff that's color is going to change to one line, which is simply a p-handle reference. That's all you need now in the new syntax. You don't need to worry about how does that get converted into metadata. So it's a lot cleaner, a lot easier to code, a lot easier to understand. 
Yeah, question. Does this then generate all the same notes as before, or is there a binary change in the format? At this point, um, it creates exactly the same binary format in the end. Um, if we, I say if, it, it really better be when. If we switch to a new binary format, then the same ex exact source should compile to either the, the current format or the new format. And my expectation is that we're going to have to have a compile switch on the, or a command line switch on the compiler. It's going to be either um, please use the new format or please use the old format. One, one might be the default, who knows. But we're going to have to support the old format for a long time. I don't see any way that we can just do an overnight cutover. Um, so so that, that's my expectation. I'm pretty sure David will agree with that. There's going to have to be a long switchover period. Another question? Uh, did I, is that the answer? Yeah. OK, so I think I'm coming from, are people actually going to start looking at fixing the issues of uh, the system on module and baseboard combinations that keep coming up. Right, right. Because I think this is a good solution for that. And at the moment, I like build six different device trees for like three baseboards and two different modules. Right, right. So that's the, the issue where the CPU module <laughs> is not the base system. So our, for most of us, our base system includes the processor and the add-on boards or I.O. boards and the problem that he's alluding to. And so our baseboard probably is where your, your device tree is contained in ROM or disk or wherever. But with the system on module, all of a sudden, your baseboard no longer knows what processor is going to go on it and what the, the device tree should look like. It's going to be the add-on processor module that knows. And it doesn't typically have storage for the device tree. So that's the underlying problem. Yeah. I think I can add to that, um, if you use the device tree overlays in U-Boot, then you can probably detect the configuration of this uh, combo system, so yes. to say, yes. and combine the SOC device tree and the baseboard device tree, maybe add-on card device trees together, and then pass it to Linux. Yeah, and that's one of the beauties of, of U-Boot, having gained this capabil capability to add overlays in. Yeah, so quick question. Uh, is there a trick to access the root node in this OLA form? Ah, you're jumping ahead for me. <laughs> question. <laughs> okay, um, just a couple more slides on this. Um, so this is simply saying, given the old version versus the new version, getting the, this is the diff between what the old format looked like and the new format. Not much. And here's this question. <laughs> what if your original base device tree doesn't have the labels that you need for the overlay. And the second part of that was, um, we, we had a solution for that, but, but even then, so the solution was that you could specify a path for the target, going, going back a slide. Um, at the very top, you'll see target path. That's where the node or the overlay gets plugged into the base device tree. So even though we could put a path in there, we couldn't put, a path of, for some reason, I'm thinking we couldn't put the root path in there. Um, but, pardon? Yeah, but we do have a solution. We're, we're good now. Um, we can go with this new syntax. Instead of actually putting a, a P handle label as to where your, your overlay is going to get applied, you have this new syntax of ampersand, open brace and then the actual path, and then close brace. And that will actually work for slash as well as for any other path in the device tree. So we actually have a solution now. The device tree compiler that's in the kernel, in the mainline kernel, already has the support in it. So that, it was really good getting that added in. Um, yeah. A slightly related question to that example. So um, the uh, the overlay format allows to like fill in the well for one, um, add the information to a particular p handle in the DT tree as well as fill in a p uh, a p handle in um, the um, 
um, you know, in some property when it's being referenced. So is right. there also some mechanism for actually filling in the like string path to the node? Hmm. I, I think I didn't the answer. I, I, so I, yeah, I, 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 I think the answer is going to be no. There, you, you have to know where the node's going to be applied independently. So essentially, you're going to be doing your own fix up on that. that that's a good qu question. So it would be useful for, for example, adding aliases. Yeah, yeah. Um, re re make sure I get this captured correctly by the end at the end of the session, because that, that's an interesting interesting thing I hadn't thought about. Um, okay. Yeah, off, off the top of my head, I, I'll have to think about that, but yeah, yeah. Well, I have a slightly related question asking for a friend. Uh, <laughs> if you have a device tree with uh, properties containing p handles to some sort of node in that device tree, and you want to use a DTO to remove I, that I'm, node, I'm, I'm and sorry, my, my brain just got lost. Start at the beginning again. <laughs> okay, you have a device tree full yeah. of some sort of properties which have a p handle to a single node in that device tree. Yeah, and you want to apply an over, overlay which will remove that node and replace it with some other node. Can you do that somehow? Uh, think of uh, reserved memory right, nodes, right, right, right. which... Well, so the, the new node will have the same name as the old node. That's, uh, that's your, your example? It may not necessarily have the same name. If it has a different name... But you can still reference with it with the B handle. So in the base device tree, it will be kind of nameless, like memory yeah, at zero. Yeah. And you want to overlay it with memory at something else, because it's a reserved memory node. Yeah. I. I, I Right now, there's nothing that will do that. that that's going to be a new, a new need to capture. Again, make sure I write that down at the end. Will do. Thanks. And at least capture it. Let, let me real fast. We're running short of time, even though I'm trying to go fast. Um, and I'll try and jump over. OK, the, the last thing that I wanted to capture was there's a lot to, that needs to be done to make overlays work for the generic case. I know that overlays have been working for years and single point cases on lots of boards for lots of people. And your use case may work, but as I discovered in our core infrastructure when I started looking at, at validation, just because it works on one board doesn't mean it's gonna work on any other board. And that's one reason we've not allowed the the overlay loader into mainline yet. We want to have a nice solid foundation before that happens. So this web page is where I've started capturing things that I think are issues. And before we have entire full runtime overlay support in the kernel, most or all of these need to be, get, need to be dealt with. Some are more important than others, and we can start phasing in partial support for overlays before they're all dealt with. And already we have FPGA support in the kernel using overlays. Um, and they have some ways of working around some of these issues or ways that we can audit carefully when stuff is added. Um, I think we'll be able to add overlay applies with only part of that list dealt with, but removal still will not work at all. So we, we just won't allow removals. So we'll just phase in as, as quickly as we can the full support but there are things that need to get fixed. So follow on elinux.org, and if you have other things that you know are problems, let me know. Yeah, question. I was just wondering if, like, <clears throat> with some of the memory problems being addressed, if you would consider maybe throwing something like Garrett's current version into staging and just, you know, more people use stuff, we see what breaks, and then it makes it easier to figure out what to fix. Yeah, um, <laughs> basically, I don't want the overlay anywhere near to where it could accidentally fall into mainline usage. And being in staging, that to me, it's, it's you, anybody can use it at that point. 
even if we know there are problems with it, people can use it, and we have to deal with, with all of the broken parts of all of the other device tree code at that point. So I, I'd be happy to try and, and make sure, um, Gear's been doing a great job, and I don't know if he'd be willing to, <laughs> here, put something on your plate, um, make sure that there's something that's well documented of, with each release, we will try or expect to have a new version of Loader following closely, or maybe someone else can, can jump up and take that responsibility. But I think it would be good to have that, that code easily added to anybody's kernel so that people can be doing that testing. I myself would like to have a reference board that's running mainline kernel supporting overlays that I can be running the overlay, overlay loader on. So give that's me a your challenge. Address, I send you one. Like, Pardon? Give, give me your address, I'll send you one. Awesome. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anybody who's r running boards on old kernels and out of tree stuff, try to get your support, at least booting and serial console on the mainline kernel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a whole list of questions. <sighs> Can we prioritize? Um, information on how to implement a device, that was basically a, a driver question more than device tree source file, or it was also how do you structure the source file? No, it's, yeah, it's basically, like, this is how you do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a major hole in our current documentation. Um, I would like to point to elinux.org device tree. I've been trying to document things there. When you see holes in that, please speak up and say, hey, Frank, please add that documentation, or hey, Frank, I'll document that for you. But yeah, that is a known problem. We don't have an answer for that question right now. We don't have that documentation. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I think I'm doing this right, you know. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, next one, error messages from DTC are not helpful. That's incredibly true. We're, we're out of time, and, and you've been presenting the whole time instead of answering questions. Yeah, that's why I'm people. trying to go through the questions. I would actually like to ask a sort of fundamental question to the room here. Yeah. Um, how many people here maintain out of tree device trees? So you have okay. derivative designs usually from device trees uh, that are in the kernel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's something we ignore a little bit too often. Um, it's something we need to keep in mind throughout right. this. So do you want to add more of those trees into the kernel source? Or no, do you just I think it's a fundamental visibility? thing that people will have devices that are not in mainline. Yeah. And by the fact that we have device tree, we've actually set up to make it with the very intention that people should be able to do that. Yeah. But and we're I, making it incredibly hard for them. Yeah, I actually would encourage people to make those out of tree device trees more visible. No, you shouldn't have to. You might have confidential products that work. Oh, well, that's fine. If they don't want to show it, fine. But, but if they're going to be useful to other people, it'd be nice if other people can find them. Yes, and, so and maybe we should be setting up a central repository that can just point to where these are so people can find them. Well, if you, if you want those to be publicly visible, don't yeah. be shy to send them to us. We'll take them. No yeah. problem with that. But if you don't want to send them, that's fine, too. And we need to be aware of people not being able to do that, maybe for a long time, depending on what they're doing in-house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the expectation is for the in-kernel devi device trees that some people didn't seem to want to put all of them in the kernel source. They just kind of wanted the references in there and the minor variations. They didn't want to create all the churn that used to be in there with board files. I, I don't do bindings. Well, device resource files kind of live more in the binding half of the world. I'm not a maintainer of that section, so Rob Herring is the person to really bring that up with. But yeah, he's not here. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add to that. Uh, if you submit your device trees for upstream inclusion, the feedback may take a while to, to arrive back, and yeah. uh, it may be a little difficult to handle. Maybe we should do something about that. Yeah, if anyone wants to become a reviewer of bindings and source device trees, please, please jump up. We don't have nearly enough people working in that area. Um, so the question is overlays and overlay management. I'm going to dodge for a minute. Uh, different DT source format. I'm definitely going to dodge Merrick. Um, overlay removal, especially not in stack order, that becomes a technical question. Um, right now, the documentation says that they have to be removed in stack order. This is for the runtime Linux kernel overlays. 
the reality is when I got to that code, that's not what it really did. Um, and I cleaned it up a little bit. The current check is when you're trying to remove an overlay, does it reference any node that another overlay deeper down the stack had created or modified? So it's a little bit more liberal, but it's still pretty tight. I'm not sure how loose we can get on that. When you start getting multiple overlays modifying the same data, um, for a driver, typically when we remove an overlay to do it cleanly, you're gonna need to unload the driver to start with. So to do things out of order, you may have to back things out, unload a lot of drivers, and then re forward apply overlays. I'm not sure if that's the answer. But if, if that's an important need to be able to remove out of order, um, definitely bring it up and start looking at possible ways to, to deal with it, possible solutions. Uh, negative numbers for property values, that's a bindings question. I'm gonna dodge that one, ask it on the list. Uh, licensing of device tree source files. The device tree source files have always been, by default, GPL. They are sourced in the Linux kernel tree. We have a lot of dual licensed device tree source files. Um, people have been adding the S SPDX. Yeah, actually meant to include DT bindings. Oh, include DT bindings. So apparently bindings. they didn't have a license before, but when Greg did the big sweep, they got the SPDX license GPL 2.0 because that's the default. But then so people- So you're, you're talking um, not DTSI files, but- no. The like a gig underscore uh, SPI, uh, which right. is a really simple one that apparently is GPL 2.0 only. Right, okay, so the idea is that you want those to be dual licensed. Yeah, last and week there was, somebody asked yeah, I was explicitly gonna say on the mail to list, make somebody it, specifically uh, asked to for relicense that. it, but there are probably yeah. lots of other files like that. Yeah, the interesting thing about those files are those files are used by both drivers and by the device tree source files. Um, Talk to the authors. If, if an author is willing to dual license their, their header file, I, I don't think there's objection to that. Does anyone else have objections to that? Just in general, in the kernel? Uh, I think we have had a big push for making the DTS files BSD licensed or MIT licensed. And right. I think that's a good thing in order to be able to reuse them across non-GPL right. kernels. And, right, and especially the VSD kernels. it's useless and if the header files are in right. different. Right, right, so, so it's a sensible so request. It, it, we definitely to, should to be To try and chase this. those I, down. I don't know what, what might get in the way of that. We certainly have to yeah. see what the authors are. Most of those files are extremely trivial and usually only have one author, so. Yeah, exactly. So it shouldn't be too big a deal. Yeah. And maybe we should be adding that to the, bind, to the source file policies and the bindings policies that we request that you do a license when you submit those patches. Yep. So we should be talking to, to Rob about that. Uh, device tree and UIO, come talk to me afterwards. That's <laughs> interesting. Um, okay, I think I've gotten through all the pre-questions. More questions flowing. Um, officially, we are over four minutes ago. There's a break right now, and Tim wants to steal the room. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll be here this evening if you want to catch me. Um, I'll be at Plumbers. Thank you all for coming.